Let us pray. Lord, even as we sang, what language shall I borrow to thank Thee, dearest friend? Words do not come easily. And yet, Lord, I am charged to speak. So open my mouth, our hearts, that we may receive that which you desire to impart on this day. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Please be seated. I don't know what it's like for you to go through the reading of the Passion Narrative, but I am sorely tempted to keep it at some emotional distance, to not actually live into the events of what is happening, not to engage my imagination or my emotions, but instead read it. That's our obligation. It's Good Friday. This is what we do. And go go out back into my normal everyday routine. If I were to do that, what would create, at least for me in this moment, is I must confess to you, a very, very superficial sermon. It would be easy to preach, in fact, to talk about how the cowardice of the disciples echoes our own, or the expediency of Pilate echoes our own moral compromises, the injustice of it all, love so amazing. But I don't think John is actually inviting us to that kind of moralism. The focus of the Gospel of John is not on others' shortcomings. The point is made, and we can in fact relate. But the central point is not to see how we might compare with those who rejected him or betrayed him. Instead, the Gospel's call actually in this story comes out of the mouth of Pilate, where presenting Jesus battered and bloodied before the crowd, he says, Behold the man. What is the call of the Gospel story? The call of this Gospel story, as much as we would rather think about other things, is in fact to keep the focus of our attention upon Jesus. Jesus. And to allow what we see to do its work within us. I must tell you that as I read the story, even this morning, I was awestruck. Absolutely awestruck. Seeing Jesus resolute in the face of his impending torture and execution. The soldiers have arisen, have come in, a garrison of both from the chief priests and the Romans, a kind of unholy alliance, guided by Judas. Any other person would hide out knowing what it is that they were about to face. Jesus literally almost strolls out into the opening. Whom are you seeking? And it's such a shock to the soldiers in the garrison that they literally fall backward. I would have liked to have seen that. These are not the kind of men who would normally be disconcerted even by the boldness of a criminal. But John is trying to make a point that Jesus here and all throughout this reading is never a victim. Even though it is a miscarriage of justice, even though the human relief of sin is played out writ large, the fact of the matter is is that through every single circumstance of denial and betrayal and suffering, Jesus sets his face, to quote the scriptures, like a flint. He knows that for this, as he says, I have come into the world. And so instead of shying away, he is resolute. Even in the face of when he could have, in fact, let himself off the hook, he always speaks the truth plainly. He never hedges his declarations. There are no accommodations to anyone. Even when what he declares sounds utterly 
preposterous. Think of Jesus standing before Pilate, an accused criminal, standing alone and forsaken in shackles before Pilate speaking of his pre-existence, his eternal mission, and a kingdom of followers. It's a wonder that Pilate didn't laugh out loud. See Jesus, who could have ended his agony in a moment, never quitting, enduring all, the betrayal, the scourging, the nails, the dereliction, the unimaginable pain, and entirely alone. Listen to the second stanza of George Herbert's poem, The Agony. Who would know sin? Let him repair to Mount Olivet. There shall he see a man so wrung with pain that all his hair, skin, his garments bloody be. Sin is that press and vice which forceth pain to hunt his cruel food through every vein, meaning every vein of the Savior. Sin, death, and hell, the demonic powers crouching at the door are bearing in their full weight upon this very frail human body empowered supernaturally by God to carry that body forward to utter and complete destruction. And yet even in the midst of that, see Jesus caring for others even in his final moments and then still not the victim, releasing his spirit back to God. All is done. It is is finished. So what was finished? The book of Hebrews calls us not only to see Jesus, but to see what he has done. Again, the third stanza of Herbert's poem, Who knows not love? Let him come and taste that juice which on the cross a pike did set again. Then let him say if he ever did, taste the like, that love is that liquor sweet and most divine, which my God feels as blood, but I as wine. Because of what Jesus has done, the writer of Hebrews says, we are invited to enter into the very holy of holies, but but by a very particular route, a new and living way, entering through the very veil of his flesh. When I read that line in Hebrews, a part of me just shook inside. You mean the way in to the very throne of God is somehow through the very crucified body of Jesus, that he in fact has not merely absorbed my sin and the sin of all humanity, but he invites me literally to come in to him and carried by that very broken and nail scarred body, I am set down into the very throne room of God, stained by that very blood, forgiven and welcomed. And that by any other way, I would be like Peter, standing outside in the courtyard trying to peer in to see what was happening to Jesus. That the very sacrifice and death is my passageway. I come here so that in fact I might come to Easter as his own not as a stranger, not as a tourist, not as one who's still trying to wonder, but in fact who has felt the nail-scarred hand of the Savior literally come and put that hand around my shoulders and say, you are mine, come and follow me. Knowing all that is asked of me in that invitation. So what do we see? We see him. We see Jesus. Not just as observers, but as participants. 
who by the very miracle of God have been invited into the veil of his flesh to stand into the holy of holies as one welcomed. That's why the line, what language shall I borrow to thank thee who, dearest friend, Words fail, but praise endures that we might ponder these mighty acts whereby he has won for us life and immortality. So come, gather at the cross, ponder what has been done, not just for you, but if you are in Christ, what has been done to bring you in that you might know that sweet and bloody union that is the gateway to eternal life. Amen. Please stand.